is starting a new series today. Uh, I don't think first John we're going to be I guess, studying the book of first John. We're going to be going through the entire book over the next uh, several weeks. And so again, if you miss uh, or miss any part of our last series on the life of worship, I encourage you to go back and, and listen to those. They're available on podcasts or on YouTube. And you can go back and, and look at all of those. We had a, a great study of what worship is and heard testimony videos and different people in our church. And so, again, I encourage you to go back and, and look at those. Uh, but this, this morning, again, like I said, we're, we're moving on to just a, a new book, a new study. And as we do that, uh, I just, uh, again, encourage you to, to grab your Bible, uh, open it up with you to First John. We're going to be uh, uh, just camping in that text this morning. So you can leave your Bible and just kind of open to, to that once you find it. Uh, if you're here with us in person, you'll have your own Bible with you. And then uh, there are Bibles provided for you in the seat. You're welcome to grab one of those. And, and you can see the page number on the outline of where you, where you can find uh, those passages of the Bible. If you're with us online, you're welcome to follow along with your Bible as well. Uh, but before we jump into the text this morning, uh, I just want to kind of start with just the, the foundation of this book. And, and as we look at that, um, Okay, we're diving into uh, what's known as the Johannine writings. Again, that's the kind of fancy spelling of the word for saying this John wrote it. Right? There, again, we have different biblical authors, and, and we see that each of them comes uh, with their own personality. It comes with their own you know, perspective on, on God and the way that they write. And we, we see just kind of the, the different, uh, their different personalities come out in their writings. Right? And, and even when you look at the four Gospels, right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were all written by different people, and they, they come with a little different angle and different tone. Uh, even though they're all Gospels about their story of Jesus' life, but yet they, they, they have a different feeling. Right? Now, John's Gospel, if you look at the four, four Gospels, he wrote the Gospel of John, and the, the Gospel of John is distinctively different than the other. In fact, I've heard it described, if, if you look at the, the first three, notice that they're not the Gospels, they're, they're basically, they give us kind of dates and times and, and events and, and a few interactions. And, and again, they're written more like uh, like, a, like a history book, right? Of just of events and, and, and happenings and, and interactions. And yet, John's Gospel is written from the emotional side of the story. It's, if the other sub gospels are, are a textbook, the, the gospel of John is, is a love letter. And, and, and if you look at that, I mean, the, 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 the style of John's writing carries throughout the other books as well. In fact, as, as, we, as we'll see in 1 John, is that he actually, there's a lot of interaction between his gospel and the, the New Testament letters. And there, there are different, different you know, phrases that he uses, different illustrations that carry through all of his writing. And in fact, if we look at that, John actually wrote um, four, no, five books in the New Testament. You know the Gospel of John. There are three letters, first, second, and third John, and he also wrote Revelation. And, and like I said, there are, are themes, there are illustrations, there are key phrases that he uses in all of them. And, and there's an overlap. And so as we as we look into this, there's again a, just a distinctly different style of writing, especially compared to Paul's writing. And yet a lot of the New Testament is is Paul's letters, and he has a certain style, right? And it comes away to John's writing is is, is different than this. And as we you know look at at this uh, this writing of John, and in fact all of of his, his writing, and one of the unique things about John's writing is that. He wrote most of his books, the gospel and all of the letters, he wrote them anonymously. Okay, now we know that it was God, I mean, we can tell that, but like in the gospel, he never names himself. Okay, in fact, there's a few spots in the gospel of John that, that he, he was telling the story, and he had to be one of the characters, and so he used this, this other title for himself in the gospel as the disciple that he loved. But okay, he never names himself. Now in the letters, um, he, he also never names himself. Now, in, in, in first John, we're going to get there. It's the first John is a unique letter compared to second and third John. In second and third John are more distinct letters. They have a, a, an introduction and a citation. And but he calls himself the elder right, in, in those ones. Now, in, in a lot of our modern translations, it, it says this is from John the elder, but that in the original language, he does not name himself. He just says. Now, the only book that he wrote that he does blatantly name himself is the book of Revelation. Okay, now, this 
mentioned at the very end of his life, and this was uh, again at the end of all of the New Testament writings, it was the latest book that was written. Um, and at that point, again, maybe I don't know what changed in John, but he, he, he named himself as the author of Revelation. He said it's the only one that he got. Now, as we look at, at 1 John, um, and and as we look at that, like I said, it is a letter, but not really, but it kind of is. If you look at the structure of John, it is it is written like a letter. And but yet, when you compare it to Second and Third John, it, like I said, it doesn't seem like it's a letter because First John lacks an intro and conclusion that is very typical for the New Testament epistles. And yet, as you start to read it, but you can see the structure of it is a letter, and it was he did write it addressing specific issues to a specific audience, just like all of the other New Testament letters. And yet, with 1 John, it has a very abrupt beginning and a very abrupt ending. You know, most letters get to have an introduction, right? Like, dear so and so, you know, there's a sign off, and, uh, you know, best regards. And again, if you've ever got an email that I'm me, I haven't signed it in this, but you know, you know, that's it. Most letters have those things, right? The, the book of 1 John does not. He, we just dive right into the deep end. Right, with the book of First John. Again, again are, are the pieces of the letter missing? We, again, we don't know, but like if you look at, at the text itself, we, we dive right in. The, the other unique thing about John and his writing, and especially about First John, is that this book has written, is written with a very circular reasoning. And, and what I mean by that is that he doesn't write like Paul. Paul writes very linear. Right? And, and again, we're familiar with a lot of Paul's letters, right? And again, Paul makes a point, and then he builds on top of that point. And he, we start in one distinct place in Paul's letters, and he takes us down this a very clear line through his reasoning. And yet, John's writing is very different. And I think the, again, the gospel does it, but I think the letter in 1 John does it more than any of his other New Testament writings. It, it, it's, uh, again, it's circular reasoning. And but yet, um, like Paul's letter can take us to stay a straight line to a very specific destination, but first John again is distinctly different. I think you'll notice that as we read through it. Now there are a few core topics in in this letter and in this book, and those are light, love, and life. And yet the circular reasoning of that is that we get brought back to those several different times. He mentions them at right, several different places in the letter. In fact, he, he takes us through this logic and we go around the circle a few different times throughout the book. Now, as we look at these three prominent kind of topics, light, love, and life of the letter, there is another prominent L word in this letter as well. But it's not a positive word. Okay, the L word, the other one that we come back to several times, is the word liar. And in fact, we're going to see that even in the text today, and it's on there, but I mean, I, I choose to not put liar on the back. Right, but if you look at that, um, again, we, we see how, uh, again, the writing is distinctly different. In most New Testament letters, it's like descending a straight staircase. And yet, when we look at the book of 1 John, it's a spiral. But yet we do get to a destination, right? The staircase does lead us to a specific place. And like I said, the, the beginning is abrupt, but so is the ending. And, and in fact, the very last verse of the book is our theme verse for the series. It's a theme verse for the book. And, and it is where the spiral staircase takes us. Okay? And that is in, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, the very last verse of the letter, the abrupt ending. It says, Dear children, Keep away from anything that might take God's place in your life. Again, we, as we read that, especially coming off this worship series, right, we realize that all these different ways that we worship is always about our heart. That's what God wants the most. And He wants the core of who you are. He wants a relationship with you. God loves you more than you can imagine, and God wants you to love Him. I notice again the theme that the, the destination of this letter as he takes us up the spiral staircase, we end up to this place. And, and again, you can feel the emotion behind God's words. Dear children, after all of this stuff, 
make sure there's nothing in the way Don't let anything else grab your heart. And again, we see this war on other gods. And then we take this back to what we look at. So let's start at the bottom. Okay, where it says, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life himself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed. We proclaim to you that we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share in our joy. Like I say, again, God is right in here. Uh, and, and, and as we look at this beginning, the kind of poetic language of, of John's writing, there is an undeniable parallel between this passage and the opening of Again, if you're familiar with the gospel, if you're, if, then you, you probably recognize that this writing. If not, I could you go back and read John chapter 1. In the word, or in the beginning was the word. And the word was the word. And, and, and we see here again, it, 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 he's saying, We are proclaiming to you Jesus Christ, right? Who was in the beginning. He, he's dives right in and, and lays the, the foundation of faith and of fellowship in Jesus Christ. And he just declares the most important point in the very first line. Right? There's a foundation of faith, the foundation of fellowship, the foundation of life itself in Jesus Christ. And, and again, this is such a core Point is the fact if you look just in our world today, look at all the different world religions, that's how you know the difference. How do they define Jesus Christ? Every one of them does. And, and we, that's exactly what John does here as we dive into the, these, these opening verses. Is he makes some clear declarations of who Christ is. In fact, I encourage you uh, to go back through, through these verses and and, and just as a personal exercise, underline every declaration about Jesus. And I'm here, I'll, I'll, I'll get you where it started for you. He starts off by declaring that he has eternally existed. Okay, that, that, that he is the word of life. That he is the one who is eternal life. Meaning, again, God's not only the, the source of life itself, but that through Jesus brings eternal life to and that, that Jesus is the truth that has been revealed to all of us. And now, as we again, even look at these, these declarations that John gives us in these opening verses, it, it, it reminds me very, very much of the most bold statement that Jesus ever made about himself. And it's found right in the middle of John's gospel. In John 14, 6, as I said, in John's gospel. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And if you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. And from now on, you do know him, and he knows you. Now, again, I said, this is the most bold claim that Jesus ever made about himself, about the Messiah, about his being divine, about all things. Because the reality is, like I said, it's the most bold claim because there's no wiggle room in this claim. Right? Either Jesus is 100% accurate in what he says about himself and all his declarations about who he is, or he is a lunatic and a heretic. There's nothing in between. And, and 
and John's reminding us in the beginning of the letter. He's saying, this is who Jesus is. I mean, I believe with everything I have, and I, I would definitely say you can write this in two years and you'll see me. But realizing that this is my primary way I can say this. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He, he has revealed all of that to us, right? That was his mission as Messiah. And through his life, his death, and his resurrection, right, we can understand and be, be a part of that. And so I guess that's exactly what John is saying here, right? As he writes this, he, he, he's telling us that what they had experienced firsthand, we can now experience the same. And then what, what him and the disciples and everybody else, you know, experienced with, with Jesus firsthand, right? They, they, they had an actual physical relationship with Jesus. Right? They, they lived with him for three years. They heard his teaching. Right? They interacted with him. They saw the miracles. While all that happened right in front of them, he said, that's what we have experienced ourselves. And now we proclaim it to you. Again, this is what he tells us in the, the first part of verse 3. This is what he says. He says we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship. Like, so that you can join in right, in experiencing everything of who Jesus is. Be what they experienced firsthand, we now experience the same. Because, again, the definition of faith is being true of what you cannot see. And, and again, that's why, again, we are on a faith journey. Right? Because it, it's a foundation of everything we need. Right? And, and again, John's telling us, right, as he writes to this, he's making these declarations of who Jesus is. He says, we have seen this firsthand, and now you can experience the same thing. You can come into fellowship with us through your faith. That that. that Everything that we experience is, is available to you. And so join in with us, right, in living as a follower of Jesus, in living out these teachings, right, and accepting his love and his grace, and, and again, all of the, the fringe benefits of a relationship with Jesus. And, and, and we, as he establishes this, right, he also reminds us. That is what following Jesus is really about. And that's that following Jesus is about relationship, not religion. Again, what does he invite us into? He says, come into fellowship with us. And it's not only just in, in kind of joining with them as other, other people on earth, but, but we, he says in the second part of verse 3, Right? He says, come into the fellowship with us as we're all following Jesus together. He's like, but that relationship is not just with us. In fact, it's way bigger than that. Right? Because our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Because God is the foundation of life. He is the source of truth. And He was there from the beginning. He's, he's the untrained creator. And that's what we were created for, in a relationship with that God. And he's saying, now come, come with us, right? And surrender yourself to Jesus and walk into this fellowship, not just with other people, but with God himself. And so many times, I think especially in our world and in our culture, we get caught up in the, the, the what I should do and the right, right and wrong and, and kind of all these things, right? The religion kind of rises to the top, and yet, yet Scripture continually points us back to the fact that it's about relationship with God. That's the foundation of our faith. It's not about religion. It's about relationship with God, about being in fellowship with Him, fellowship with His family. And that's what John is reminding us of as we, as we dive in and we open up this letter. And then we see from this, right, that, again, that we start with faith. 
Man, we grow through relationship. And then we thrive with joy-filled fellowship. Now, again, fellowship is another one of those churchy words that we kind of throw around, right? Like, hey, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have fellowship together. Right? And, and again, it's just this, I mean, it's a word describing relationship in God's name and for God's glory. Again, I can have fellowship with you. I have fellowship with God. And, and, and in fact, I can't even have fellowship with the world, right? Even if they don't believe in God, is I can come in God's name and still have a relationship with them. If it was, and again, to bring God to the glory, right? In the hope that they will find the truth that I live in. But again, we start with faith. We grow through that relationship. And then we thrive with joyful fellowship. And that, again, is one of those fringe benefits, right, that, that comes with being a part of God's family and being a part of his church. Like, a church is not a building, right? It's not a place that we come on a Sunday morning, right? Church, biblically speaking, is God's people. It's relational, just like we are with God. Like, we are God's church. We are his body, right, the way the scripture I think as we think about this, again, this, you know, this idea, right, of, of fully sharing in the joy, right, that's, again, he's very clear, that's what he, why he's writing. He says, we are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Again, he starts with that firm, that firm foundation of that Christ is the source of our joy, right, but we want you to join in with us, right, and to find the same thing. To live that life of walking with Jesus and, and learn who he is and be transformed by his spirit. And, and we find, again, the joy that comes with, with genuine relationships. Genuine relationships with God and with each other. And again, as, as we're here, like I said, around the room, we, we look at this and we know like, we, have, we have a fellowship with each other just because we're here and then God's presence is here sing together and talk and, and read and pray. Again, and, and, and I'm just to say is that there's, there's a joy and a fellowship that we experience when, we're, when we do physically come here together right, that we can't experience online. Again, if you're watching online, I'm glad you're there. Hey, but, but it's not the same, is it? Right? Everybody here is being like, yeah, I watched online. It's not the same. Now, again, if you're watching online, like I said, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you can be connected in a way when you're not physically here. But if you can physically be here, you need to. Yeah. Right? Because it's different. It's a different fellowship. It's a different joy that you experience when you're here in person. And this is, again, what John is inviting us into. They say, this is why I've written and then, again, he continues on in, in, the, in the, next, the, the next five verses. Okay? We're going to go back to the text here. He lays this foundation of who Jesus is, why he's written. And now he says, this is the message that we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light, as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our heart. Again, here we get a real sense, right, of John's character right, and his bluntness. And, and, and again, and even you can feel the emotion behind these words, can As he calls us out, and he says, again, I, I definitely want you to, to experience this joy, this fellowship that we have with God. And I want you to join in with that. And, and then he dives into this, though, right, very quickly. 
right? In, in the very, again, first declaration statement of verse 5. And he says that this is the message we heard from Jesus, and that's what now we pass on to you. God is light. And there's no darkness in him at all. Again, foundational declaration about who God is. Now, all throughout Scripture, this is an illustration that John uses a lot in his writing, but it's not just John. All through Scripture we see there's this illustration of, of light and dark. And, and again, that, that God is light, right? That good, that purity, holiness is, is represented by light. And, and evil is represented by darkness. And again, this is a theme that runs through all of Scripture, not just through John's writing. And yet John pulls it out very specifically in this place, right? That God is light. Yes. Yeah. And there is no darkness in him at all. Again, no shadows, no shades of gray, just light. God, that's who God is, right? That Again, a representative of, of his purity, of his holiness, right? of, of the, the character of who God is, right? There's no darkness in him at all. Again, as you think about this idea, this concept, you know, we can once again go back to this concept that's, that's presented in John's gospel. As we look back once again at the words of Jesus in John chapter 8, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Yep, sign me up. I want that light. Right, we've all stumbled through the darkness, haven't we? Like physically in your house, you stumble through the darkness. Right, you stub your toe. Right, you trip over the dog. Right, like this, whatever happens in the dark, right? He's saying, again, Jesus is inviting us into a relationship with him, and that relationship means that he just lights up our life. Mm -hmm. right? And reveals the truth of what's around us, reveals the truth about what's in us, right? And says, and now let my light penetrate any darkness that you have. And, and, and again, he, he said, right, he is the light of the world. And the way to find that light, into you, bring that light into your life, is to follow him. And, you know, as we look at that again, if we look back at the text that we read, and we take this concept, right, that he's presented in verse 5, that, that, that's reiterated by Jesus in the gospel. And then we look, look at verse 6 and 7. Okay, because verse 6 and 7 presents us with two distinct options. Okay, it, it describes for us living in spiritual darkness or living in the light. Again, there, there are two distinct sides of this coin. Right? There is a light side and there is a darkness side. And as he presents both options to us in verses 6 and 7, right, we are faced with the ultimate question. Not whether the light exists or the darkness is there or whatever, right? We all know that that's true. Right? The question that we're naturally presented with out of these verses is which one are you living in? Right? Which one are you choosing? Are you living in darkness or are you living in the light? Which one are you living in? Now, there's a very important issue to point out in verse 6. Okay, and look back at verse 6. Okay, where he says, So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. Now again, I, I want to be very clear about this. This is a very, I think, important issue that's raised in verse 6. Okay, the issue being addressed in this, in this verse is not, uh, not living in darkness. Again, if you don't know God, if you've never received Him, as your Savior before. Maybe you're here in person, maybe you're watching online, and you're just trying to, you're just trying to learn about who God is. 
right? And you say, no, I am living in darkness, right? God's not part of my life. That, that's not what this verse is calling out. Okay, now if that's you, if you are just hearing about God for the first time or trying to figure it out, where we'll get, we'll get there in a second, okay? The text goes there, but that's not what verse 6 addresses. Did you, you pick up what verse 6 is actually addressing? Okay, verse 6 actually is calling out the person who claims to be living in the light, but is still living in darkness. By the way, that is the definition of hypocrite. Right? It is somebody who claims they are following Jesus. Again, they say all the right things, but they go on living in darkness. And there's that there's that no one. Right? That's what John's calling out. Hey, now, again, I, I don't know about you, but I'll just, I'll just tell you about me. I've done that before. I've said the right things, and I've done something different. Right, we all have. And then John just calls us out in verse 6, and he says, don't choose that. Like I said, if you are just stumbling in darkness because you don't know God, you've never heard about God, like I said, verse 9 is for you. We're going to get there. Okay, but verse 6 specifically says, if you say you have fellowship with God, but go on in the spirit of darkness, you're in a very, very It's the, again, this is at the core of even what we talked about in the last series, right? About, about what, what true worship is, right? Because every form of worship will transform you. And if you are genuinely experiencing Christ and entering in that relationship with him, then his light has to come into your life. And that light will convict you about the darkness that's there. And a genuine interaction with Jesus will transform you. It will move you forward. And this is what John's calling out. In fact, if you look at this entire section that we just read, there are three verses in this section, in this section of text that addresses the dark side of the coin. It's verse 6, verse 8, and verse 10. Now, all three of them are about claiming something that isn't true. And yet, if you look at these verses, right, in that, is it, 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 it escalates quickly. Again, we go from us lying, us lying about our own lives, to the last verse of verse 10 of, of calling God a liar. Again, it, it escalates very quickly. And how do we get there? Again, look back at verse 5. The statement of truth given in verse 5. What is it? It's that God is light, and there's no darkness in him at all. And yet all three of these quote-unquote dark verses is about claiming that we don't have sin in our lives when we actually do. And that's ultimately us sitting back and saying, God, thank you, but no thank you. I don't need saving. I'm good without you. Which, by the way, is the biggest lie of all. In fact, that is the biggest lie that the enemy uses in our world today. You don't need God. You're fine on your own. Is a lie. You're not. You're living in darkness. Again, it leads us back to the most basic truth about the gospel. That there is a God... And you are not him. And you need him. Because you can't be who God created you to be without him. You were made for that relationship with him. We need him in our lives. I need him in my life. You need him in yours. Because the reality is I am lost in the darkness without him. And once I can admit that, 
that I'm floundering in darkness without God, then I can end up at verse 9. And what does verse 9 say? If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us those sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. <coughs> Praise God! Right? This verse tells us how to get out of the darkness and into the light. Right? And it starts with admitting that I am in the darkness. And God, I need you. And, and, and again, I, I, on, your, on your outline, please circle, underline, highlight, stars around the word confess. It, this is the door. Out of darkness and into light. Confession. Right? And, and again, it starts right, with a, a, a confession of our sins to God for the first time. Right? This, this verse is, is an invitation to leave the darkness behind and walk into the light. Right? And it's the most basic confession of all. is that, God, I need you, and I am a sinner, and please forgive me. Come into my life. Shine your light. Right? And, and when we start there, then that light can penetrate into our lives. And this, again, is the way you leave the darkness behind. It's confess. And I'll say, that, again, that, that's how you join the journey of faith, right? You confess your sins, and you, you, you start that journey with Jesus, and you let it in your life. But I'll tell you, again, the reason why we need to circle it, and then, because it doesn't stop there. In fact, in fact, your life of walking with Jesus needs to be a life of confession. Right? As God's light starts to reveal new things in your life, that's when you sit down on your knees and be like, Lord, you're right. Please mold this out of me. Right? And, and again, that then we are then transformed by God, right? As that light continues to penetrate into our lives. Again, the, 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 the truth bomb that John drops on us in this section of text is that we are all in darkness because of our sin. And if we claim we don't have sin, we are lying to ourselves and we are lying to God. Right? And, and, and yet, again, and the point is that the world is a very dark place. Right? It is sinful and it is dark. But then, again, the, he doesn't end there, though. He doesn't stop there. We're going to continue on to the next section of the text, John 2, verses 1 through 6. Where he says, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is a sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. And that is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Again, verses 1 through 2 is where we get this softened tone right after this huge, big truth bomb that is dropped on us in the last section. And this is the best truth of them, of them all. And that is the fact that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice that atones for the world's sins. Jesus is a perfect sacrifice because there is no darkness in him at all. Again, and a, a tone, atonement, this is a big fancy theological word. I put it in there as a fill in, just so you know. That means that Jesus steps in your place and pays your price. That's what atonement means. Because he was the perfect sacrifice. Here we see, in, in, again, in John verse, uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's who Jesus is. And again, I'll tell you, if you realize that you are living life in the dark right now, here's the best news of the day. 
You can join the journey of faith by letting Jesus pay the price for your sin. Will you let him do that? Will you let Jesus pay the price for your sin? He's already paid the price. He's just asking you to accept it. He's just asking you to let him in. Will you let God pay the price of your sin? Again, if you have never prayed that prayer, today's the day you can pray that prayer and say, Jesus, pay the price for my sin. Because I am a sin. And I need you. But we have to remember that the gospel is not just a one-time thing. It's not just to say the right prayer and then I can just go about my life and do whatever I want. Right? That prayer is a commitment. To, to start, to continue on in this journey. And that's what he tells us in verse 1. He says, my dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin, but if you do, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father, and he is Jesus Christ, the one who is true, righteous. Again, we join the journey of faith by receiving Christ our Savior, inviting into our life, confessing our sins for the first time. But those, those prayers of confession should be a regular part of your life of worship. Okay, because he, he tells us in verses 3 through 6, right, that how we show our love for God is by our obedience. Mm -hmm. And again, that's what we talk, right? Our worship is loving God back. All the things that I do, right, how I love God back. I show my love for him. And we show that through our obedience. Okay, how, how do you get into the light? Well, you get in the, into the light through God's grace and mercy. How do you stay in the light? Obedience. That's how you stay on the right path. Right? That's how you, you grow in Christ. That's how you be transformed by His Spirit. That's how you become more like Jesus tomorrow than I am today. That every day, I walk with Jesus and I live in obedience. John 15, verses 9 and 10. He says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. So remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Again, Jesus models for us what it takes to continue to move forward in faith. In fact, is he was obedient to the Father. He says, now just follow my example and remain in the light Right? But you've got to fight to stay there. And if you stay in the journey by doing what God tells you to do, it's so simple. And yet so complicated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Again, that's, but this is exactly what he tells us in chapter 2, verse 3, right, that we already read. That we can be sure that we know him. If we obey his commands. Again, underline and circle the phrase, we can be sure. Because again, this is, I hear this over and over and over again. I'm just not sure that I'm saved. Because guess what? The enemy likes to throw that out there, right? That lie, right? About like, you're, God didn't save you. You're not, God didn't love you that much. You're not really saved. It's a lie. You can be sure. But how are, how are we sure? If we commit to staying in the journey every day. Right? To, to do what Jesus tells me to do. Again, this is one of the most common tactics of the enemy. And you notice that he, he says, right, that, that I, I know him, right? I know God. Again, it's about a relationship. It's not about checking out boxes and doing a religion. Right? It's about staying in a relationship with God every single day. And yeah, I don't know where you're at in your faith journey today. Like I said, maybe you've never received Christ as Savior. Maybe and you realize that it's like, man, I'm just I'm stumbling in the darkness. Right? And, and again, today you can pray and ask God into your life. And take that invitation of forgiveness and, and step into the light. Maybe you have prayed that prayer, but yet you're realizing, you're like, man, but I'm, I'm still living in the dark. I'm a liar. Right? But you can draw the line in the sand today and say, I'm not going to do that anymore. 
But I'm, I'm going to walk with Jesus every day. No, I'm, I'm going to pursue the light in my life. Right? I'm going to do what he tells me to do. The final thought this morning is this. In a dark world full of lies, God offers us truth and life in Jesus Christ. What step do you need to take in your journey to truly live in the light? Not just come into the light, but to stay there and to continue to move forward.